This live presentation was produced in Ashland, Oregon by the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library and Event Center. RVML relies on the support of our volunteers, members, and donors to organize and present these programs. For more information about this presentation or to borrow, download, or purchase other recordings from our catalog, please visit our website at rvml.org. Not to be in incredibly tacky, but I arrived here and I'm like, oh my gosh, the previous event is not let out yet. <laughs> so <laughs> I have to confess, we did not expect to have so many people for a Sanskrit class, <laughs> especially on a Tuesday evening. <laughs> so the fun thing about this is it's going to be kind of relaxed and um, free form. We te we've taught this class um, at the University of Loyola Marymount. We have taught um, at different um, small venues and that sort of thing. But, um, and we have done larger ones, but this, I have to confess, is in the top two. <laughs> we, taught one, <laughs> we taught one Sanskrit class for like 120 people in Denver. That was awful, because they were all cheating, and none of them were doing what they were supposed to be doing. Um, <laughs> with the smaller classes, we can, we can sit and talk to everybody and make sure that they're doing it right, and you know, yell at them if they're not, and that sort of thing. Smack, no, I'm just kidding. But this is smaller, so oh, sorry. This is bigger, so we're gonna. Um, but this will be a little. This will be real fun and really relaxed. And um, this is an opportunity for you guys to ask questions and share your own experiences and that sort of thing. So we're gonna not. We're not. This is not a concert, unfortunately. Though when there's a large group of people, being, you know, we are entertainers for a living, spiritual. As soon as you have a large group of people, first thing you want to do is do a concert. Um, <laughs> so we are gonna do a couple of con songs for you this evening, um, and then it's gonna be both. So. It'll be just more lecture, less performing. <laughs> so we're going to begin with a piece called the Narayana Upanishad. And um, this will get us all kind of in that place. And then we will move on right along to the class. No, 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 up one, up one. Good boy. Just give us a starting note then. Ata purusho havai narayano kamayata prajaha srijayeti narayana prano jayate mana sarvendriyani cha kamvayo jyotirapa prithivi vishwasya dharini narayana brahma jayate narayana rudro jayate Pranava Swarupam Akara Ukara Maka 
Vishati, Tari Ram Param Pundari Kam Vigyanaganam, Tasma Tari Davan Mantram, Ram Anyo Devaki Putro, Ram Anyo Madhusudano, Sarva Bhutas Tame Kam Narayanam, Karana Rupa Makara Para Brahm. Sakritam papam na shayati Madhyanti na madhitya bimukho dhyana Pancha patako papataka apramuchate Saravera parayana punyam labate Narayana sayajyam avam noti Narayana sayajyam avam noti Ya evam veda etyo panishat Now we will expect you guys to be able to chant that piece at the end of this class. <laughs> Is, oh, no, you're very soft. You have to turn it up, Dan. Um, so this, that experience, that th those scriptures, we'll, we'll start from the beginning. Those scriptures are from a book, set of books called the Ancient Vedas, spelled V-E-D-A-S. Because we don't have a board, I'm, we'll spell things if you guys wish to write them down. First of all, I need to know, can everybody back there hear us? Okay. We, we're usually pretty loud. Nobody ever says, wow, the quiet foremans. Um, so in some respects, having no mics is just fine. Um, or having, having minimal, minimal amplification. But basically, that is a section of the Vedas. And the Vedas are incredibly potent because they contain the most original presentation of Sanskrit. Sanskrit, the word Sanskrit means the perfected. It is a perfect language. There are no exceptions to rules in Sanskrit. There are just more rules. So <laughs> while being perfect, it is also incredibly complicated. Sanskrit is such a perfected language. It is so perfectly structured that it was originally going to be the language for computers. So as opposed to the binary, the zeros, and the ones, it was going to be based on Sanskrit because of its perfection, because it is so perfect. The thing is, I don't know what happened in between that step, and it would have been really cool, because then I would totally understand computers, computers much better than I do. <laughs> but um, something happened, and it is ones and zeros. But that was how perfect it originally was. It still is. Your um, essentially, this evening we're going to go ahead, we'll talk about some of the history and some of the metaphysics. We'll do a couple more songs. And, um, and then we will, um, actually our brother is going to a play. He's actually only 15 years old and he sat through this class many times. So uh, when somebody offered to take him to a play, we were like, oh sure, <laughs> thank you. Because then if we need a kid to stay for other classes, then we can kind of go, well, you got to go to that play that one time. <laughs> now you got to stay. So. He's gonna be. He's gonna. We're gonna do a couple of, of other songs for you after we talk for a little bit, and then we'll go ahead. To, we'd love to do some group chanting too after that. So it'll be really fun and it'll be very interactive. So Especially since you guys are sharing, <laughs> this is gonna be some of this is memory Sanskrit. I know. Uh, actually, I thought I was being really generous. I was like, oh, make 35. That's plenty, you know. It's Tuesday night. No one's gonna show up for a Sanskrit class for heaven's sake. But I'm so pleased that you guys could join us. And that, that actually says a lot about Ashland, because your population isn't actually all that large. Um, and there's actually a percentage of the population in here. So <laughs> I'm looking at this to maybe be a huge hub for the rise in world consciousness. I don't know. <laughs> we're noticing that the longer we're here. You can come back again. We're going to. Our uncle is here. So and we love it here, actually. So, okay, with regard to Sanskrit, oh, at the beginning of the, the sheet that we gave you, I'm going to steal yours. Um, there's like one per row. Um, there's an article in here called Defining Sanskrit. If you guys would like um, packets, if you guys did not get a packet and you want one after this, I'm going to send, I'm going to make up 100 or so and send them to this metaphysical bookstore. Maybe if they could just put them on their counter and you guys can just take them if you wish. Um, 
so just let us know. Are there, you know, if somebody does want these afterward, if you're like, okay, I've had about enough of this Sanskrit stuff, you know, <laughs> Spanish. I'm gonna go learn Spanish. <laughs> that will be much more practical. This is just complicated. Um, actually, it's not. Once you get into it, it's just totally fun. Anyway, there's an article in here called "Defining Sanskrit," um, and this is for you to read on your own time. So when you guys get home and have a bunch of bhajans in your head and chanting things, you can go, "What was that?" And you can open up your little article and um, delve into some of the stuff we're gonna speak about tonight. Sanskrit is. Basically, it is at least 5,000 years old. It is 5 to 10,000 year old language. And it's debatable because if you go into a university, they're going to give you the lowest number that they can possibly give you. But if you actually were to do some research, which we have done a lot of, and we have... Um, and plus we're archaeologists. In real yeah. life, we're actually archaeologists. Um, we're only Shanti Shanti, like, well... In real life, we we're Shanti Shanti, too. <laughs> um, <laughs> non-glamorous life, we're actually archaeologists, so we did a tremendous amount of research because we're going, these dates don't make sense. And saying that Sanskrit is five to 10,000 years old is the most controversial statement we're going to make this evening because you will meet people who will absolutely say, nope, it's not that old. You're like, but I have scriptures and I have documents and I have stuff that prove it. They're like, nope, it's not that old. <laughs> the problem is, is in school they teach you, they start with the Greeks. They will, first they start with the whole talking about evolution and the, you know, you have, it goes from the monkeys to you know, Australopithecus, then you have Homo erectus, then you have Neanderthals, and you have people. And then they go from people, and then they're Greeks. <laughs> <laughs> and then they start with history. They go, okay, there are the Greeks, and then there's the Romans, and then there's medieval times, and everything fell apart. And then you have the Renaissance times, and everything came back together. And then you have, you know, the 1700s, where everybody overdressed. <laughs> and then you have the 1800s, where they all started trying to be scientific. And then you have the now, and now everyone's just kind of going off in a million different directions. That is the way history is taught. At least that's the way I was taught history. Unfortunately, there's a huge gap from the monkeys to the Greeks. <laughs> and that's the space we're going to cover tonight. <laughs> and the problem is when you tell somebody, oh, it's five to 10,000 years old, they're like, well, that doesn't make sense on my time frame. OK, well, <laughs> what do you want me to say? <laughs> Don't take our class. Um, unfortunately, we, we have this huge gap. So that's what we're covering tonight. Sanskrit is the most ancient language, or uh, in a, it is a foundational language because you can trace all these languages back to Sanskrit. And um, well, we talked some about some of, about this on the concert. We're going to speak about this again tonight. And she does a wonderful illustration of how um, Sanskrit is a language. You want to do it now? No, I, okay. I will do it later. <laughs> I would. Um, <laughs> For Sanskrit, basically, we look at Sanskrit as being, given the fact that it is a foundational language, it's, it's very concentrated. And so we look at it almost like as butter. And then all the other, the Indo-European languages, which has been our main focus, but it also you can go into a lot of the other languages as well and be able to trace them back to Sanskrit. But we look at all those other languages, including English and everything else, as being like watered down low-fat milk. <laughs> still comes from the same, this creamy source of butter, but it is just a, a very diluted version of it. So Sanskrit, it, it is our base language, but we will be going into that later on and go more into depth about that. So. Actually, actually, you just... Okay, or we can do it, like, right now. Um, <laughs> I just like your stories. Um, <laughs> um, as for, like, just a couple of examples, we use Sanskrit words all the time. You don't know that they're Sanskrit words, and these are just, these are just a couple of examples. There are people that we know that can trace anything and everything back to Sanskrit. They, I mean, we thought we had no life until we met these people, but that's all they do. Well, actually, this came from the root of ka. That's a, that's a Sanskrit word. It's like, so we actually, we don't, don't take it that far, but we are very intense about basically tracing as many languages as we can back to Sanskrit, because we like to show how much of a base language it is. Um, the number three, that is a Sanskrit word, comes from three, means three. Shampoo, that is a Sanskrit word, soap to wash, to wash with. Um, the word vomit is a Sanskrit word. Translates straight across. Um, I didn't if mean you to go do. to the dentist, that's, I know, that's, I know. that's lovely. Um, if you go to the dentist, the Sanskrit word for teeth is danta. Osteoporosis comes from the Sanskrit word osti, meaning bone. If you are, if you um, pedestrians, comes from the Sanskrit word pada, meaning feet, or on foot. Um, if you were to take, um, do your, oh, awesome comes from. 
or come, comes from excellent the, comes uh, from the or super comes no, from no, the no, awesome word. does too. Uh, Ashtadiyavat is Sanskrit, so oh, okay. awesome is the same thing. Oh, I did, that's a good one. <laughs> um, I and I was thinking of another one. I was thinking of the word excellent, incredible comes from the Sanskrit word supra, super. meaning super. <laughs> so I mean, there are all these words that you can trace back to Sanskrit. Nirvana you, is a Sanskrit word. Um, Pundit, as a political pundit, yoga. As diet, you guys always hear about Oprah's latest diet guru. Guru, guru. is a Sanskrit word. <laughs> and you, we're actually finding these these Sanskrit words that are flooding into into um, into English. Actually, at, at uh, when we're out on an archaeological dig, when we find something, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the Maha artifact. And now I'm noticing everybody else is saying it too, because <laughs> and Maha is in Mahatman, like a Gandhi means great or the, the best, totally like large. So anyway, when we, when I, and you, you find these words are, pick, are being picked up and used because sometimes the best word to describe something is a really ancient word. And also, everybody always assumes that Sanskrit's like this dead language. It's not really dead to us. It, it's, it's, it will exist, it has existed long before we came along, and it will exist long after we leave. It is an ever-present language that just kind of, it goes in waves. It comes in and out, never really dying. Just it, it rises and it comes into society with like a strong punch and it travels quickly. And I would say that at this point in time, especially in this town, um, <laughs> it is definitely, it, there is a rising in it. It is being used. It is in yoga. It is in in every aspect, in meditation, people are using it all the time. They don't even know it. But it is becoming, at this point in time, it, it is very popular. It is, it, it's also, the language is not really the issue. The, what is the issue is what the language causes the human being to experience. And actually, not just the human being, because this can be experienced in plants and animals. You can actually see this manifest in many different layers of, of living beings. It is what it causes the human being to be conscious. An instant, not all, not all, we've learned this, but a really <laughs> high percentage. Oh, once in a while you'll have something go, I had no experience from that. And I always think of, I always hear the word yet. Yet. Yeah. Give it time. Yes, give it time because, and sometimes people aren't, those areas are not open. And it doesn't mean, it doesn't, it's not an indication that anyone's any further or along on the evolutionary path. It's just as indicated, indicative that some people have really worked at opening these channels and some people will be doing it soon. How many people have read um, the, uh, any of Eckhart Tolle's books, Power of Now? The Power of Now is a, a lot of you guys, this is great, is about residing in the now, in the moment, in the present. And we absolutely love him. He is so cool. His, his books his are incredible. They're, they're, they're very inspirational. The cool thing about Sanskrit is that with all the chaos of, ever, of our daily lives, our jobs, families, um, children, um, just the daily functioning through everything, the stress, the stress of it all, everything. It's so hard to shut that off and reside in the moment and be totally clear and be with the real you, peel away the ego, everything else. It is very difficult to do that. And with, it's really easy to do it. This is what we've learned. It's really easy to do it. It's like if you're at an ashram or you're meditating at some kind of retreat, effortless. As soon as you get in the car and somebody cuts you off or you get, <laughs> or you get a stressful phone call, or you open your mail. The second you do that, all of a sudden you're not you're not in this magical place anymore. Then you're stressed. Oh my gosh, everything bad's gonna happen. And da 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 da. Well, <laughs> what we love about Sanskrit is that particularly Sanskrit, the Vedas. Sorry. Particularly, I you off. The, it's okay. We're Italian. We do that. So don't. Um, <laughs> with Sanskrit, it is almost like it's like the key. It is like it is instant now. You you listen to the Vedas, or most of the time people you know they pop in a CD or whatever. We're not, I'm not self-promoting, but however, to get that Sanskrit out into the atmosphere, it brings you to that place of now, right now. And it, with all the stress and everything else, people say, you know, everything was crazy and crazy, and then I stuck in the CD, and then it was like, whoosh. And it is. In the, it's it a is sanctuary in a CD. And, I, and what's really cool is CDs are so cheap. So it's not like, it's not like join this special club for $599. No. It is like instant experience. You this know, language allows you to reside in the moment. It, it truly does. And it takes away. You try to be stressed and you try to maintain that, oh, gosh, I'm in traffic and I'm mad and everything else. And you almost, you almost can't. We, we listen to Sanskrit all the time. It's, Throughout, we play it in our in our where we live and everything else just to bring that that instant peace. That's very hard to come by these days. It is very hard, and also we like I hate to say this, but you know, like a lot of artists don't listen to their own work because it stresses them out because they hear all the mistakes. 
we actually do listen to our own Sanskrit to remind, to bring us back here. Because just like everybody else, we have a life that is really chaotic. <laughs> and um, it reminds us of, of the true you, the, the you that is that after you peel away all those layers of nonsense. Of nonsense. It is, it is that essence, the essence that you came into this life with and the essence that you will leave with. And that is why even us, we listen to it because it peels away those layers. It allows you just to reside in the moment. I can tell you, we were at a business meeting. This was about a, two years ago. And these guys are the most LA, harsh, <laughs> coarse music business. You know, and you're just going, you just feel the aura when they walk in. You're like, oh. Um, <laughs> and they were, and they, we'd been dealing with them off and on. And they, they were not, oh, they were not fluffy, new age people. They were just like, where's the money? Um, <laughs> so, and we hadn't really played, we told them about, oh, yeah, we've done all this stuff, and da 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 da. But we hadn't really played them who we are. And you really don't, because we knew, as soon as we put it in, we were expecting them to go, oh, this is a bunch of nonsense. You know, I'm not really into new age spirituality. We were expecting that. And they, and, um, so we were like, and they're like, hey, I want to hear some of this stuff. <laughs> makes you, already makes you feel great. Um, so my dad's looking at me like, no, no, oh, yeah, we, we'll play later. No, we'll, no, let, we want to hear it. So I put it in, and it's just like, you can just feel all, all of our deflated. We're like, this is really going to be painful. Because <laughs> um, this is not LA cool. This is not, this is, this is, inter, um, this is timelessly and eternally cool. This is not cool as in like, <laughs> going to be on the race. Spears. Yeah, this is not, well, <laughs> although that was passe, but yeah. something cool now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, these really, bleh, guys, so listening to our stuff. And all of us were going to, and all of a sudden, we were actually in the back of a limo. <laughs> so, but even at that, you're just going, okay, this is really unpleasant. Let's get out of here, you know, kind of a thing. And we put the stuff in, put the Sanskrit in, and all of a sudden, the mood went from this really contorted bleh to this, all of a sudden, it was absolutely clear. And it not only clarified them, because all of a sudden, you go, oh my gosh, that's who they really are. All this nonsense isn't even the person. We all of a sudden became very clear. And all of a sudden, it changed everything. And we're like, and it was terrible because it was such a reminder that, you know, Sanskrit fixes or, or clarifies the atmosphere no matter what. And if you really do think that, then it also should be able to do it for really um, people who are not playing in the field of consciousness. So, and it pulled everybody back into center, and it was beautiful. Um, it also works on little kids, too, when they're acting really bad. Just put the <laughs> CD in. So my brother's going to have to go, and we'll, we should do a couple of, of songs, and then we'll, we'll go back, and we're going to jump in and start chanting. So, and you go, we'll do, and we'll also do questions and stuff. But um, let's do, let's do the, okay, let's do the Ave Maria. Okay, tell them where this comes from. Okay, this is, this piece is actually the Hail, you know, Hail Mary full of grace, or Ave Maria um, in Latin. This is the, that in Sanskrit. And um, it's really cool. This was translated by a little Italian Jesuit priest in 1865. Wow. And the translation was so cool. I was like, oh, wow. And we sat down with this, and we're like, OK, we're going to write a really serious Gregorian, Gregorian chant style piece. And what came out of it was more like Whoopi Goldberg does Sanskrit in the sister act. I mean, it wasn't what we had intended at all. So, but it, it actually, we couldn't steer away from it. No matter how serious we tried to get, I really felt oh, like, fine, right there. and then we even went and got, um, rented the movie Sister Act. And that didn't help. But um, it didn't get it out of our nervous system. So that's more like what this piece is like, so. Okay. We don't have mics, so we're trying to figure out how to project out to you guys. Namaste.
Beatles, and then I'm gonna go home. Okay. Yeah. What do you think? What's okay, we'll do two. We'll do two, and these are English. These are to give you guys a little mind break because you're gonna be in Sanskrit all night. So. Yes. <laughs> this is the break before the intensity. Usually it's the break after the intensity, but we're gonna do it before. Um, one of our ways to basically expose as many people as we can to this language is through English because the pop songs that we do or I mean well, I guess I, are they pop or rock songs that we do are um, I just say upbeat okay music. upbeat music <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to put us into a specific genre so we call ourselves the only Sanskrit rock group but technically we're not really very rock we're, um, we're but kind it's just, of a folky rock group. Yeah. But, um. but you can't say that because that does not even sound cool. I mean, that's cool here. But. <laughs> Should I tell everybody real quick this story? Because if not, your night is going to, you guys yeah. have a lot of cover. Yeah, cover. but well, no, let's do, let's do this first and then we'll do that. Because Mike but is going to go. I know, I was just going to say real quickly. Okay. okay. Uh, does everybody know how come this happened? No, what the deal? Okay. Oh, let okay. me tell you the story real quick uh, because you, he's got to go to. He gets to go to the plate that you guys have the Shakespeare Festival. Then you have your mic. Mike, we can't hear you. Can't hear you. <laughs> you guys have the Shakespearean Festival. <laughs> How's that? Okay. You guys have the Shakespearean Festival, so I'm my my mic is just not very loud. There's nothing I can do about it. You guys have the Shakespearean Festival, so Junior has to leave. But real quickly, here's here's what the deal is. Oh. Oh, oh my own mic. <laughs> How about that? No. no that. It is on. Testing, da da. Can okay. just get on top of it. All right. Here's what the deal was. Um, no. <laughs> no. Yeah. Well. Gonna, I think they're going to they're make a, a sound adjustment. Okay. I'll talk as loud as I can. There you go. There you go. Um, here's what the deal is. is um, I'm a music producer. I'm a video producer. That's what I do for a living. The girl's mom, um, my wife, Micah's mom, too, is an Ayurvedic uh, practitioner. And we uh, basically are Catholics, but we, uh, we, just like everyone else, started meditating and doing yoga and stuff. We're talking decades ago. And um, we were kind of going through our life in a relatively normal fashion. And my wife had Ayurvedic books that were half in English and half in Sanskrit. And our oldest daughter, which is this one, not the bigger one, but the littler one <laughs> is the older one. She kept, at nine years old, kept stealing my wife's books and kept saying, Mommy, which side of the page do you read, the English or this stuff? And we didn't read Sanskrit, so we said, well, honey, we read the English side. My wife kept saying that to her. And she kept saying, well, why don't you read the original stuff? <laughs> and she's nine, and we kept saying, you know, shut up, go outside and play, that kind of thing. Um, and to make a long story short, um, we kept having to take my wife's books back from her, and at the end of the summer, when she was nine years old, we looked under her bed, and she had completed pages and pages of a Sanskrit dictionary, but we don't speak Sanskrit. So we're going, well, this is weird. This does look like Sanskrit. We've done enough meditation and whatnot to know what that was, but we... Uh, like that. Thank you, honey. Thank you. How's that? No, don't touch it. Just talk to you. Okay, it. how's that? How's <laughs> that? Go. And, of course, and, and so we were freaking out because the child was, like, reading Sanskrit, apparently, but we didn't even know what Sanskrit was supposed to sound like. So we uh, sent it off to a professor at the University of Iowa, and he says, this is, like, 90-some percent accurate. And then she kept, Andrea, we'd taken the kids to see some pujas, and she kept saying to her mom and myself, well, they always chant in twos. Will you chant with us? And my wife and I would say, no, we don't speak this language, and we don't even know that you do. And one day we came down the hall, and we could hear two little voices, and the two little voices were Sarah, who was seven, chanting with her sister. And so we, we had this, this horrible feeling <laughs> that we had a problem, and <laughs> Andrea said, look, Mommy, Sarah's even faster than I am. She can do it, too, you know, so we knew we had a problem. And then things kept progressing. We figured, well, how are we going to tell everybody how weird our kids are? <laughs> By that time, they had a little brother who was 15, and uh, they started teaching him Sanskrit, and one thing led to another, and, and the net end result became Shanti Shanti. And since then, we've been on 
you know, like if you ever listen to Art Bell, we're on Art Bell, or we've been on The Tonight Show, and things like that. And this has sort of taken over our lives. Originally, I told them to learn Spanish, because <laughs> it was more practical, but... I, I took Spanish. I did that. I was really bad, though, and the teacher kept going, wow, you are so bad. Languages. They're only good at ancient languages. They're good at Hebrew, Latin, and Sanskrit primarily. So that's, that's kind of how it happened, and now we're in trouble. <laughs> So with that in mind, I wrote this song called Miracles, and that's where this song comes from. That's why I did it. That's the song we're going to do right now is Miracles. And it's in English, except for the beginning. Okay. Ready? I believe in wondrous miracles, candles burning in the dark of night. What I said We'd moved to Denver, and um, we hooked up with these managers that thought they were going to change us and turn us into like kind of a Buddha Britney Spears thing. <laughs> and so we said, we're going home. <laughs> so we got in the car, and Sarah, Sarah goes, this is a perfect opportunity to write a soulful country tune. <laughs> so that's what we did, and and we this is what the song is about, is, is going back, finding who you really are, going back to the, your roots. And then, okay. are you gonna, is she going to do? No, I'm working. Okay. Oh. Sorry, no, my dad was asking me a question. Um, and the really cool thing about this is that... Just play it quiet. I can't think. <laughs> I, I can't think. Um, the really cool thing 
about this is that my brother, about uh, while we were in Denver, <laughs> while we were in Denver, he um, he would never sing. He, I couldn't get this boy to sing because he was surrounded by musicians, and he, you know, he's he's a kid, and you don't. So we we never pushed on it. And then finally, when we got into Denver, I'm like, I think you can sing, and I want to hear it. So sing. And he did. And the really cool thing was is that he sounded like a really big black man. <laughs> and I was like blown away. So I'm like, okay, you're gonna sing with us on this next record, which is coming out. And it's got him, he's all the way through it. Like I just can't get enough of using his voice. Um, but the bad news is, is I'm his father and I'm supposed to like have the big male voice. And so I sing like, oh, I like this city. And he's like, oh, so I, I'm feeling a little bit bad about that, but. <laughs> There's nothing I can do. So on this song, he definitely sings on this song, and it's what was basically our country song that we wrote. And it's a it's a so song of the South, you know. It's it has that. Our next record's called East Meets South, <laughs> and it's Sanskrit and Gregorian chant with a little bit of soul. This is a little bit of soul. So. supposed to be here. That's why I'm going Okay, <laughs> Sanskrit and a little bit of the South. Actually, we did this because we did a lot of concerts in Atlanta. And we're like, dang, this is fun. So, um, and we just loved some of the sweetness that we experienced. So we're like, what if you mix that with what we do? So, and when we first got home, and I started writing the, I started when I first showed my dad the song when we got back from um, our long trek from Denver to Reno, which is where we're from. Um, my dad was like. Well, that's weird. He goes, I don't know if that's going to work. And I'm like, no, no, I really like it. And so we finished writing this song. And then after we were done, my dad's like, well, it, it kind of works in like a weird way. And then Micah started singing. And he's like, OK, this is weird. You know, so we got, <laughs> on top of that, we got a gospel choir to sing with us on the CD. So I mean, now he's like, that totally works. So. <laughs> That's it. When your dad is your, has been your music producer your whole life, you know, you're always like, would you like this? What about this? <laughs> and he usually lets us kind of do whatever we want, but sometimes he'll give us a hard time about it. So um, I wanted to ask you, you're holding up little signs. What does that mean? Oh, till a break. Oh, it's okay. Okay. break. Okay. Actually, you, can we break now? Okay, let's break now. Everybody, like, go air out, <laughs> and then come back, and we're going to start some chanting. And don't leave. This is going to get very exciting. Um, yeah.
yeah, I probably will forget to mention the product because I tend to do that. Uh, or I mention it too much and everyone's like, stop hawking your CDs from the stage. Um, so I never do it right. But yes, everything you buy means I don't have, we don't have to truck it back home. Um, so it's a matter of giving us a little bit more space in the car. And, um, and also, we'd love to share. It's, it's easier because then you don't have to pay shipping or anything. You can just take it home. And, and also, it's very sweet. Everything, it goes right back into the family. It goes right back into the operation. It's, it's, it doesn't go to some, something else. There's, this is a very um, minimal operation. <laughs> it's family, and pretty much everybody who works with us or for us is either family or wants to be. Um, <laughs> for better or for worse, I always say you have no idea what you're getting into. Thank God you're not related. Um, but so anyway, everything that you do does support, does support this, this expression. Okay, so we have a limited amount of time because you guys are on like a schedule. We're going to pass around what Sanskrit looks like. The line goes on the top. Yeah, don't turn it upside down. <laughs> and um, this is, that is what the Vedas look like. When, when you, but everybody always like will email us, like, oh, can I have all the words to all your long Vedic pieces? And I'm always like, okay, I'll send you this because <laughs> that's what we're reading. So um, the short stuff we give people words to, but the long things, that's what it comes in. It's just the, just the scripture like that. What we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and turn to page on your little workbook that you're going to have to share. Six. And it should look like this. It's got the alphabet on it. And it says alphabet. And on the next page, it has the same thing, only it's kind of like a cheat sheet. So you can see what all the letters of the Sanskrit alphabet are. And if this, if, if you guys have us back for a traditional class, we're going to go through the alphabet, and you will leave the class being able to read Sanskrit. But because of the way this is structured this evening, and also because it's a little hot and stuffy, I don't know that we have the patience for that this evening. So we're going to do a quick overview of the alphabet. And then we're going to move right on to the chanting. <laughs> so, and we'll chant a small section of it. But and we will be back, and we do these workshops all the time. And they go, we actually can can and do have multiple levels of the workshop and stuff. But it gets very intense. And if you guys think you're hot now, <laughs> wait until you start um, delving into this alphabet. It makes like you, you get you so turn much chi. You're gonna you're like a pressure cooker. <laughs> yeah, and you can feel it in the room, and it's very obvious that when you have a Sanskrit class that's really um, very intense. And so the alphabet is structured. I can tell you guys this. The alphabet is structured basically, um, it goes from most simple, and then it gets progressively more complicated with each letter, as far as more complicated in the way that, that it is produced in the mouth. Um, this alphabet, the Sanskrit alphabet, was the foundation for Dmitri Mendeleev's invention of the periodic table of elements. He started with the most simple element and got progressively more complicated, ensuring that his columns and his rows, see, yeah, rows and columns, lined up, and each, each row means something and each column means something. In Sanskrit, it is exactly the same way. And Alex, it was his, his understanding of the element silicone, which at the time he called eka silicone, which is Sanskrit, that he figured out, oh my gosh, if I, I can arrange the elements like the Sanskrit alphabet. So what we're going to do, um, it starts off as vowels. And basically, it starts, the first vowel is a. Uh. You guys say that? Uh. Uh. It is the most simple. It is the most basic. And then it, it actually does exactly as the element, periodic table of elements does, which is where it gets more complex. It doubles. So you have ah, uh. ah. Uh. Uh. So here's the interesting thing. So the first one is a, uh, as in it's short. Everything is metered, and it has a, a specific number of beats for each letter. And what this does is, have, has anyone ever heard of pranayama? <laughs> that, is the, that is controlled breathing, and it's used for in meditation. And this controlled breathing creates a calming effect. Well, this language inherently has pranayama in it. And by just chanting the alphabet, you get really buzzed. <laughs> um, and so basically, how this works with the Sanskrit alphabet is that not only is the language perfectly structured, but the setup of the alphabet is perfectly structured. That is why Dmitri Mendeleev thought it was awesome. Um, is because 
within each of these things. It starts at the back of the throat, the beginning of the alphabet, and with each row, it, you're traveling further up, 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 up. So it starts at the back, and it ends all the way at the lips. Show them the first row of vowels. Even the first row of vowels does this. So the first row of vowels, it goes, starts at the back of the throat, and it ends at the lips. So when we're going to do doing this first line. I'm going to, I'll say it for you guys. It goes, uh, ah, e, e, u, u. Do you guys want to try it? You guys, let's try this first one. Uh, ah, ah, e, e, u, u. And you see how it started back here? And it ends at the lips, forming the oohs. Well, everything else in this alphabet is perfectly structured just like that. It travels from the back of the mouth to the front. Do, do, the, second, do the second line. The second line is, are called, called diphthongs. They are basically a combination of the letters in the first line. And the, the interesting thing about this is that each of these within that one beat or two beats, each of these has two, two beats. beats. Because it has two letters that combine to form those letters. So the first four of the second line, I'll say them and you guys can say them back. It goes A, A, A I, 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 O, O, o ow, ow. So you got A, I, O, ow. A, I, O, ow. Very that good. That was impressive. <laughs> That's really good. You guys like repeat everything we say. Um, <laughs> and then the, to the last two is um. Say um. Um. Uh -huh. uh -huh. And that's regular. You can feel your stomach. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Very good. So that, there, there's that space. So it goes a i o ow. Then the last two it goes um. Uh huh. Um, uh. Okay, let's do the whole row. A, I, I O, o ow, um, um, uh. uh. Wow, good. this is freaky. You guys are really good. I love this. Um, if we do a class, you guys to totally have to come back and we're going to record it and then we'll put it on the website. <laughs> yeah, seriously. You guys are like the most structured. I, I've never seen this before. <laughs> the next three are the last, these three at the bottom are tricky. They are. And they're not that tricky. Okay. Every time we say they're tricky, it scares people, and then they make it harder than it actually is. It's not tricky. They're really easy, and everybody can do it. <laughs> <laughs> with the Sanskrit alphabet, we don't look at it as when you try to associate it with one of the 26 letters, of A English through Z, uh, in our English alphabet. It makes it very difficult. But if you were just to look at the Sanskrit alphabet as a continuation of our alphabet. There are new letters. This is letter number 27, 28, 29, 30. These are not... These are not to replace English. These are added on to English. So all you've done is add, add letters. So this is not, um, we're not trying to, you know, drill new things into your mind. We're just offering you new letters to play with. So these last three being different in addition to the alphabet. The first one is, it's, a, it's an R sound, and it goes, re, re, and the tongue just flicks. Re, re, very good. And then the word Krishna, Krishna, or Rishi. There you go. That's, that was what I was going to say. Um, and then the last two are never, almost never seen. Um, they're just there. I think they're there for the song because the, everything's long, short, long, short, long. So I think they needed it to. We've maybe seen them like once or twice. Once or twice in all of our years. We've in been the, doing this for 15 years. So they're, the first one is used. So it's re, re. So the first one is short, which is the first one that we showed you, which was re. Then the second one is the same thing, but it's longer, so it's just more rolling of the tongue. So it goes re. re. So it's just longer. So the first one goes re. Then re. Then the very last one is an L and an R. So it goes lare. Very good. Okay, this is freaky. Let's, See, no, let's sing the song. Hard. Let's sing on the song. Then you guys, you want to put this in a song? Okay. We put everything to a song because just as with everything else, when you sing your little song, it. it it makes it stick in the mind better. Like the alphabet song, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Oh, this is the same thing, but this is actually used in meditation. I mean, it's said that you can reach enlightenment by just studying the Sanskrit alphabet. So this, this is another tool. You know, if you, if you don't have a CD player or you don't have one with you, you can just, uh, uh, e, e, <laughs> ooh, ooh. No, I'm just kidding. Actually, it's better if you chant it. Um, so we'll go through the, the vowels part of the song, and then we're all going to chant it together a couple of times. Given the fact that you guys are so 
like on top of it. Um, we're going to do it. So, <laughs> so we're gonna, we'll sing it through once, and then we'll all sing it through together a few times. Uh, ah, e, e, u, u, a, i, o, a, u, um, ah, re, re, la, re. We didn't know how to make those musical, so we just tacked them on in the end. Um, so we'll sing it one more time, and, and we'll then let's conduct you with the long and the shorts and all that other stuff. We'll sing it one more time, and we'll conduct you. And remember, it goes everything is 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 metered, so it goes short, short one beat, and then two beats are long. I'll snap so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Okay, you guys are just <laughs> okay. <have> do it. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Now we're all gonna do it together. So be loud. Not that I was worried. Um, okay, let's do the whole all the whole thing of vowels. So it starts with ah. Uh. Uh, uh, e, e. Good. Very good. Let's do it again. Uh, uh, e, e, u, u, a, i, o, a, o, um, uh, r, r, l, r. Yes. Um, isn't there a long version of the very last one? No, no. There is not know. a long version of the of the last of the lorit. There is not, and it's so rarely used. I think they figured that that would just <coughs> cover their bases. Can you say it a few times because I haven't really heard it. The la, it's an L and an R, so it goes lorit, lorit. So it's like it, it's like the first rit, but now it's got an L in front of it, so it goes lorit, lorit, And it takes a little bit of practice, but it's. It, it, don't fight it, and it, it, it usually it, it'll, it flows as you continue to use it and say it. That's one thing. Sanskrit is self-correcting. So even if you're doing it dreadfully wrong, just keep doing it. It's more important to keep doing it because it'll either fix itself, and you won't even know it. You'll all of a sudden just be really comfortable. Or somebody, somebody politely and humbly will come to you and say, Try it this way. Or you can, I mean. Contact us. Yeah, or contact us, and we'll, we'll tell you. <laughs> We're coming out with our workbook this summer. And it is called Learn Sanskrit in Just 300 Years. <laughs> and um, it's to take off that whole stress of time, because, you know, time is arbitrary. And ever, anyway, so basically, we're coming, out with, we're coming out with the book this summer, and it will have a CD in the back to listen to the alphabet and listen to um, the prayers that we're going to do tonight. It'll, it'll have everything in it. And then, plus, we'll also continue to do workshops, and we're going to be back here. So. Um, <laughs> So I'm um, looking at the time. It's 8:30. What um, you go, do? You want to go through the, the consonants, or do you want to do semi vowels with them? Let me ask you guys. Do you guys want to continue through the alphabet, or do you want us to go jump to the end of the alphabet and do a song, and wait until we come back to to go in this more dip? <laughs> well, you're going to be chanting. It's just a matter. Do you want to chant the whole alphabet, or do you want to chant a little piece and then chant other things? Okay, I'll, I'll we'll share with you how the consonants are structured, and then we're going to chant the semi-vowels. The consonants are structured. Go, go, where it says consonants? It's the whole middle section. The first line in each. We'll go through. We're going to talk through each row, and then we'll chant at the very end of the alphabet. The first line are called gutturals. They're all produced in the back of the throat. Once again, each of these rows travels from the back to the front. front. So with each row, it's almost like a shifting up in the mouth, shifting to a different position closer to the front of the mouth. So the, the last row, and the way this is structured in the whole um, consonant section is hard, aspirate. This is where the pranayama comes in. So hard, aspirate, soft, aspirate, and then nasal. And so what she means by aspirate, that is within Sanskrit, that's the, once again, the controlled breathing. And it's a, basically like a puff of air that comes out. The letter doesn't change, but with the it goes hard aspirate. Well, that aspirate's the same letter. It just has a puff of air. So, so we'll do. We'll chant that. We'll, we'll no, say the first lines, yeah. 
and then we'll, we'll say them, and you guys can hear this. And then when we take it, when we do a bigger class, we can all sit at, um, we'll go through this methodically, and we'll check you and, and um, ensure that you're puffing lots of air, too. <laughs> that sounds funny. Um, <laughs> okay, so the first line is ka, ka, ga, ga. Nah. Nah. See, we took the sound and ran it through our nose. And that was just that first row of consonants. So we'll do it one more time. The first one is ka. Then the second one is aspirated. Ka. Then ga. Then ga. Then nga. Like ink. Ink. It's the N said at the back. Yeah. And they, there's different tongue positions and everything else. And we're not going to get into that tonight. But that's what every row feels like, is it has that hard, then you puff of air. Soft, a puff of air, and then a nasal. And what she means by hard, it goes hard, aspirate, soft, aspirate, nasal. The hard is simply that you don't need your voice box to form the letter. So you can use that without using your voice box. Ga, you can't use that without using your voice box to form the, the GA. Ga, it's required. But you can use that without, so that's hard, then the aspirate with the air, and then soft, which is you need your voice box, and then nasal, which is where it will, and once again, with each of these, this whole row travels from the back to the front. So we're going to go to my favorite part of the Sanskrit alphabet, which are called the semi-vowels, right here. It's the second to last row. And there's a really cool song. Is our dad there? Okay, come here. <laughs> there's a song that goes with this, and we'll chant this. This is wonderful. This is so purifying, and it's good for your chakras. The, the semi-vowels are ya, ya, ra, ra la, la, and va. va. And so ya, ra, la, va, those are associated with your chakras. Ya is the heart chakra. The ra is your solar plex chakra. These are energy centers in the body. La is your foundation, your base chakra. That's your root. That's where your material wealth comes in. And then va, that's your sexuality chakra. That's procreation, babies, relationships, that sort of thing. So when you chant these, you're, not, you're enlivening your chakras. You're enlivening the energy centers that are all along your body. And that's put within the alphabet. Dad, did you leave? So what's really cool <laughs> about this is that there's all these essential, there are these tools that are just within the alphabet. So you've got controlled breathing for meditation. You have the chakras which are associated with, the, which are the energy centers throughout the body. So by just chanting the alphabet, you're not just chanting an alphabet. You're doing so much more than that. You're enlivening all aspects of the body so and we're mind. Gonna, we're going to chant, look, let's chant the semi-vowels, and then we're going to do some of the group chanting. And this is wonderful. So this, this you can take with you. you. If you learn nothing else about the Sanskrit alphabet, your semi-vowels will carry you for a while. So we're going to do a song, and we'll, we say, say the yada lava a few times, and then we will we'll cue, cue you, you guys, and we're all going to sing it together. You guys got to cue me, too, because I don't know what you're doing. I, actually, okay. we'll do this one a cappella, and then we'll do the other we'll one. We'll do it in the right key, then. Yara lava, yara And then we'll all sing it again. I can do harmonies and stuff like that. So we'll do. We you guys got to sing my part. Yeah, we sing it, and we, we sing it four times. There's different melodies with each time we sing it. So let's do it again. We'll do it one time through, and then we'll cue you guys. Yeah. Rattling, is it the guitar? 
That was really good, you guys. That was, that was very really good. good. That was very good. That was Sarah picking up and talking yeah. into it. Oh, that was you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now, so that is the semi-vowels. They are not quite vowels, not, not quite consonants, but I would say the root and the heart of the entire Sanskrit language. So let's turn to, it says mantras. This is the last page. It says page 27. So that was just a general overview of the alphabet. Very quick overview of the alphabet. So this top one is the Gayatri Mantra. And what is wonderful about the Gayatri Mantra is it is a universal prayer invoking all the different elements to come here and to, to bless us and to give us grace and that our life may be slightly and somewhat easier. Have you guys ever been to a puja and they all seem to be doing a thing and you kind of know it's like, you know, like this. This is the prayer that you never know. So, like any any of the Indian ceremonies, they this is a very common prayer. And if you do know it, then we're going to give you some. This will be good pronunciation, and we can, uh, and that way you can. Don't go to your yoga class and start correcting everybody. But you'll, <laughs> but you'll know a bunch of you'll you'll go. Oh, that's aspirated. That was a puff of air that they spoke of. So, um, so we're going to go through and we'll chant it. And then, um, and then we'll chant it as a group. We're going to chant this in what's called meter. There are a lot of really pretty ways to sing this mantra. This is not one of them. This it's is the authentic Vedic way of chanting it, which produces a completely different effect than the melodious way. It's not better, it's just different. So for the sake of this, of this little discussion, we'll go ahead and use that. We will sing it through, and then we'll all sing it together. And so just relax with it and, and be open-minded. And, okay. Om Bhur Bhubasvaha Tatsaitur Varenyam Bhargo Devasya Dhimahi Dhyoyo Na Prachodaya Atta We'll sing it one more time and then you guys sing it with us. And we go like this, that's the aspiration thing. Since we couldn't didn't go over it, we'll, okay. we'll indicate to you what it is. Om Bhur Bhubasvaha Tatsaitur Varenyam and that dayaat t is it's done for syllables because they, they needed another count in there. <laughs> it's done for rhythmical reasons. They need that extra beat. It doesn't really mean it doesn't mean anything. It's just sometimes it's attached onto the end of pieces. So we'll go ahead and we'll do it a couple times. Om Bhur Bhubasvaha Tatsavitur Varenyam Pargo Devasya Dhimahi Dhyoyo Na Prachodaya Atta Again. Om Bhur Bhubasvaha Tatsavitur That's very good. And this is the very traditional stuff. So it's not like, like extremely melodious. It's just very serious. I'm going to put this 
Okay. Okay. So now, and now we're going to do something that's since my dad really wants to play guitar. We'll do something now. Well, you, you brought me out here. I'm kind of stupid if I don't do something. <laughs> oh. like, we'll do Dad, come on, this I'm just piece down. Like, <laughs> you have to give me something to do. Um, we'll do Asato. This piece down here is um, called "Lead Us from Ignorance to Knowledge, from Darkness to Light, and from Death to Immortality." And actually, it's on the first page too. If you want it written even bigger. It's a universal prayer. You see it all the time, often um, in yoga studios. I mean, you see it everywhere. This and it's wonderful for clearing the atmosphere and rebalancing your energies. It's wonderful. So that's why, that's why we, we really love this piece. We're going to sing through it one time, and then we're going to sing through it a lot of times and that's so I can do some harmonies. So I like to be harmonies. Um, <laughs> So we'll sing it through, and, and this one's a lot more melodious. You'll be able to instantly hear that the difference. This is more like a like a modern pop tune, I guess you could say. Like yeah, this is the, you'll hear the difference between the if you just chanted really Vedic stuff, and then you're going then this is more melodious. You'll hear this is more modern, it's still ancient Vedic words, but the melody is different, and so you guys can feel how the melody changes the effect of the Sanskrit. So we'll sing it through, and then we'll cue you guys. Chant Om Namah Shivaya to close the evening, and then we're going to take questions. You ready? Oh, yes. It's very. This last piece is very easy. This is to the aspect of God that is the destroyer of ignorance, and the destroyer of obstacles. So. The destroyer of ego and all the things that we think we are. Dude. So we'll sing through it, and then we will cue you guys, and you guys will sing it through with us. Listen to it. How can you say that? Okay. 
that's just the four of us. But then when you multiply it, quad, times it by a lot, <laughs> um, it, 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 you're taking all these pure Sanskrit tones, pure Sanskrit words, prayers to God that have been around for thousands of years, unchanged, and you're putting these out in the atmosphere. And it changes consciousness of this town, of the state, of the world. And the thing is, is that even plants and animals, so you're affecting, you're affecting so many different things. You're affecting living beings on, a very, on the most primordial level that we all exist, which is the ex experience of absolute consciousness. That is the reason we're doing this. That is the reason we, we've traveled everywhere and are chanting Sanskrit and singing our music. And that is the reason why we love the fact that you guys are here is because you too, on some level, we, we, we view Sanskrit as it's not just a dead language that, that you guys have come to, to engage in. You guys are supposed to be here. And something, something inside of you has said, on a Tuesday night, it would, be, be spent, it would be a good idea to spend your evening with a Sanskrit band and <laughs> talk about world consciousness and the consciousness within each of us. So I would like to open the floor now to you guys if you have any questions. Hi. Just, okay. I'll repeat um, your question if you just ask it, and then I'll tell everybody what you said. Okay. Is this on? There it is. Um, I'd been at a lecture before about uh, ancient Hebrew language and how it was formed from uh, different hand positions and all this sort of stuff. It made it sound also like a very original language. And I was wondering what you know about, is there any relationship between Sanskrit and the Hebrew? There absolutely is. Um, San Hebrew is also a base language. And um, I don't know, the sp I, we, we've worked a little bit with Aramaic and Hebrew. We do chant Hebrew. Um, she's, she's very comfortable uh, at it. When we go to a temple, she always makes me look bad because um, she's really good. Um, but there, it is, it is a very much of a foundational language. I don't know the specifics of how it came from India, how the, the whole concept of um, spiritual languages came from the East and moved West. I do not know the, the, the exact specifics of it. I always joke around and say, oh yes, Sanskrit was brought over from India and it was brought over by a bunch of dyslexics and they reversed it all and turned it into Hebrew. <laughs> but that's not true. I just made that up. I just... Um, because Hebrew does read the opposite of Sanskrit. It reads from right to left, whereas Sanskrit reads from left to right. They're both spiritual languages. The energy is very different. Not better, not worse, just different. 
and you can listen to chant, Hebrew chanting, and it does absolutely create a very meditation-like effect in the body. Um, but it's different than Sanskrit, and so. Oh yeah, no, no. It is a basis. I mean, for instance, the word in English, each and every one, each can be traced back to Hebrew, which is echa, which can be traced back to Sanskrit, which is eka. So, I mean, there is definitely a correlation, but as far as the exact time frame and exactly who brought it over and who did what, we don't have that information yet. So you think Sanskrit predates Hebrew? I think Sanskrit predates Hebrew based on archaeological evidence, but there's, I also think that they existed si at, si at a lot of points simultaneously. They influenced each other, let's put it that way. So It, it started off in the, in the Indus Valley, which is sort of halfway between what is today Pakistan, and it moved all the way as far as um, Ireland. That's why you'll hear in music like the open fifth of a bagpipe is very much like a tambora in India. And it's like if you drop a bucket of water in a big basin, the water will be heaviest where you dropped it, and it will be heaviest where it splashed at. And the Indo-European languages started here. In India, in northern India. They ended up on in like Ireland and Norway. That's why a lot of the gods will tie back like Indra, from India is like Thor, from Norway is like uh, Zeus, from Greece. You'll find a lot of parallels in them. That, that, that fundamental culture ran the whole gamut there, and it ran right through the Mideast. And it influenced spirituality, and, and they, they also, and there, was, um, there was, they traded with each other, there was an exchange of currency and language and thought and philosophy. So who, you know, which one exactly, you know, if influenced another, you, you, you do have kind of, um, it's definitely gray. And so, and depending on what people, uh, someone's spiritual background is, you know, I've heard this one lady said, well, the oldest language in the world is Hopi. You know, and that's because that's her philosophy and that's what she's been raised with. And I said, do you have it, you know, what else do you have? She said, I just think that. Okay. <laughs> that is her belief, that's awesome. And, um, and so for Indo-European languages though, you could definitely trace that back archeologically and that's, as well, I said, well, do you have archaeology? She says, yes. I said, okay. <laughs> so another question. Yeah. Uh, once you learn the alphabet, you can read Sanskrit, but how do you learn to write it? By practice writing the letters. <laughs> well, here's the thing. With, the, the, with Sanskrit, it's not, there are different aspects to, to learning the language. There is the listening to the chanting of it, which has one effect. There is the listening, there is the engaging the language on a very a grammatical basis. So learning the alphabet and then learning how to write it. So you learn how to first say it. Then uh, in our workbook, I mean, we've got basically pages of, of where you can just sit and practice writing the letters and stuff because truthfully, it just takes practice. Yeah, you just, just like when you were in kindergarten and you're tracing the letter A and the letter B, this is like trace the letter A uh, and then you trace the letter A. Uh. It's exactly the same thing. Um, as far as the way, the same way that you learned English letters. Any other questions? Yes. When are you coming back to teach us? When are we coming back? Well, um, actually, our new record will be out um, hopefully very very soon, and um, the book. And so I'm kind of thinking January would be a good time for us to come back and see you folks, and um, and we'll do a, kind of a workshop format it, we will all delve into this, and it's awesome. The Sanskrit buzz that you experience from learning Sanskrit is a lot different than the Sanskrit buzz that you experience from listening. They're both awesome, and they're, but they're totally different. And, and your, your body will feel the difference. You'll go, oh gosh, I feel so, um, I feel so alive and so clear, and it's, it's wonderful. I'd like to hear a little more about your current archeological work and what you're doing. <laughs> Actually, I, I, can, I can answer that question. Andrea, in college, she majored in anthropology and archaeology. And Sarah majored in business because we decided that one of us had to have a practical degree. <laughs> <laughs> and when we moved back from Colorado, she ran into one of her college buddies. Well, no, no, I, I was telling, actually, that exact day, it was the 4th of July, and I was saying, when I grow up, I so want to do archaeology. And then Sarah goes, well, you are grown up. <laughs> what? <laughs> so I ran into one of my friends from college. Okay, sorry, I keep Ran into one off. of her friends from college, and um, he actually was working for an archaeology firm, and they had, they had taken tons of classes together and over the years, and so he said, come by, you know, come by and, and talk to, to my boss and, and, you know, see what's going on, because she's got the major, she just 
put it to our business, to Shanti Shanti, which is totally cool, because you know both are dealing with old, dead things kind of thing. <laughs> um, so she, she didn't really see any problem with that, but then she's like, okay, I want to try this archaeology thing. And so she went and did an interview, and she, before that, she asked, can I bring my sister? And he's like, well, did she major in anthropology too? It's like, no, but I, can she come anyways? And so she actually, my, uh, my sister brought me along. And we talked to the to the boss, and um, he didn't seem to like us. And we thought, okay, we're definitely not getting that job. Um, and so we <laughs> we left. And then, like about three months later, they called us, and they said, they said, they said, yeah, we're going to give you guys a try, you know, see how it goes, see if you last. And um, that was like a year ago. So we've been doing, and it's just like if if we're not on tour right now, we're working on a record. So you, it's really hard to be on tour and work on the record. So, but it's really easy to work on a record and then go spend a day out in an archaeological dig. And there is so much archaeology going on in northern Nevada and in northern California, which is actually surprising. And we didn't know that until we started looking, because you don't meet a lot of, like, I mean, you see, you watch Indiana Jones, and you're like, that's so cool. But I've never actually, I've never, before this, I never met an archaeologist. <laughs> and then what's actually sad is in the company that we work with, um, she actually has better job security than me because I get really tired and I start complaining and I need a snack. And she just is like, she's like, nope, it's fine. I'll climb that mountain to get you know this, this artifact or that artifact. And I'm like, yeah, she'll climb that mountain. <laughs> so if one of us gets fired, it'll be me, not her, because they love her. And they're like, well, your sister, she actually, the big thing is that she can bend back um, wrought iron. Because when you're set up, you know those perfect squares that you see on TV? They really do do that. And so you drop these perfect the squares. The units where you excavate down. You excavate, the and they drop these squares. And she uh, accidentally one of the wire, one of the wrought irons were bent, rebar, and she rebar. straightened it out. Rebar, 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 and she straightened it back out. And so she, she's definitely not going anywhere. She has so so much job security. <laughs> she's the only she's the only archaeologist that can take a piece of rebar and go. <laughs> she's very strong. I don't get it. But anyway, it's very fun. Um, it's it's. It's, it's not, I mean, I love Shanti Shant. I love doing the concerts and stuff more because it's just a little less um, intense. But it is so good. It really grounds you. It really balances all your chakras. It's a great opportunity to really practice your techniques of, of being absolutely centered because you're out in the middle of nowhere for most of your day. And it goes with our Sanskrit stuff very, very well, Very actually. well. Depending, like whether we're studying rock art or um, artifacts and that sort of thing. Plus, they're surrounded by snakes all the time, too. This is what they come home to meet. I'm their father, and they come and go, Well, we saw four rattlesnakes today. And I go, Well, don't they kind of rattle and run away? And the answer is, No, Dad, they don't even rattle, and they come right at us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great job, you know. <laughs> but I was, I was telling him it's, it's good because at the end of your day, Shanti Shanti looks so much more appealing. <laughs> I'm like, Dad, let's get this record finished so we can go back out on tour. And um, <laughs> but we actually love it. So we do love it. We do absolutely love Sanskrit it. Sanskrit is our passion, and it will always be that. But the archaeology thing's cool. It's very cool. <laughs> we have another question. I'm wondering if there's I'm wondering if there's anywhere in the world that you could go and sing this, where local people, tribal peoples, or whatever could w would understand more of what you're singing. Well, there are places place. in India where there, and also any place in India, people would be relatively familiar with the words. But the reality is, is as soon as we give you guys a meaning, the reason why we just give you a quick overview and don't say, okay, well, we, we don't read you every single word in English, is because that distracts. The mind wants a definition to latch onto. The reality is, is we're trying to get past the mind, past the definitions, and get to the experience of consciousness. And if we, and because and, I had a teacher that refused to give anybody, any of his classmates or any of his students, defi definitions. He says, because then that becomes the focus. What new definition can I find to try and categorize this? That's why our book has learned Sanskrit in just 300 years. There is no de defining, there's no definition of time, no, no category. So we want people just to relax. I and mean, we know everyone's mind at first is going, I don't know what it means. That's good. That's okay. Let it go. Just be there. Be in the sound. One last question. As a family, you're such a cohesive, radiant energy. You're, as a family, you're such a cohesive and radiant energy. Your dad and you two and your brother and your mom. Do you have any intuitive sense or guidance? Or have you been told about your past lives together? We get this question a lot. Um, we, can't, we do very much what, what we're here and now. And so we're here together. We've, I think we've been together a long time. But people can get real caught up into, well, my, in my past life I was this, or my past life I was that. We're trying to really 
It only matters right now, because that's it. That's there really. That really is all there is. Is right now here with us in the in the room, all of us together. This is it. Could it be reincarnation? Yes, it easily could. I don't, but I think on that same level, y'all have that same reincarnation thing as well, and can be, and you are also bringing your own gifts and your own things into e this lifetime for your reasoning for being here and everything else. So yes, that's totally a possibility. And then the other thing is just. How many people, everybody here, you bring gifts, you have your, mer your own miracles that you see every single day. Um, and so we also just view it as, as just a gift. The reality is, is you guys have all spoken or been relatively familiar with Sanskrit at some point in your existence because you wouldn't be here tonight, I promise you. It was drawing you here. The language was drawing you back for, for whatever reason. For whatever reason. You guys are here with us, and we so appreciate you guys being here with us. And thank you so much, Bridget, and our uncle Dan Teglia for inviting us. He's not here. He He's went, not here. He took our brother. Um, <laughs> they left. And um, thank you guys so much. And you, you've done such a wonderful job. What did, I can't remember. Pure? Pure. Pure. I, um, she did such a wonderful job announcing and helping us coordinate everything and um, it's sell product at the last event. And, and we have a, a sign-up list if you guys want to sign, um, sign your email and your name and we will contact you guys when we come back into town to teach a, a class, class and have a concert and stuff like that. And Hopefully. Their, uncle, their uncle lives in Medford, so we, we hadn't been here in quite a while. My wife and I had been here before she was born, or she might have been two or three, but that was it. So we this is our first forever. time back. And so we've been back in this part back. of Oregon. We've been Portland, Seattle, you know, England, but we hadn't <laughs> been back here. And when we came back here, it was so pretty. We like it so much. So we're now, and, and their uncle's house is really killer with the swimming So <laughs> we went and looked at the Redwoods. We've done a lot of stuff, and we really are looking for an excuse to come back. So please, yes. you know, help us so we can come back and do another show here, because we want to come back and hang out at his house for another couple of weeks or and you, here or something. So. And you guys have been so great. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Very cool group. Okay, we'll, we'll do a piece for you. We will have the CDs and the book for sale in the back. And, and an email uh, list. An email list as well. And uh, before you leave, would you please help us put this, the chairs away? Thank you. We'll do one last piece for you guys. Oh. RVML Resource Center is a volunteer-operated federal 501c3 tax-exempt nonprofit organization. RVML is dedicated to providing easy access to a comprehensive collection of information on a variety of metaphysical, spiritual, and personal development subjects. RVML accepts and appreciates all donations. Material and monetary contributions are fully tax-deductible. This recording is not copyrighted and permission is granted to broadcast, exhibit, or duplicate all or part of this program for non-commercial educational purposes. This live presentation was organized and presented by the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library and Event Center. For more information, please visit rvml.org.